and we're good to go and we let people in as we keep going. So thank you so much, Diane. We really enjoy having you tonight. Well, thank you so much, Jason. It's really an honor and a joy to be here with all of you. And I know that um, uh, I'm looking forward to this. I hope, uh, I hope you enjoy it. And I thank you all for, for coming. And I thank all the people who have helped me through the years, through guiding me through a lot of this research and supporting me. So I, uh, I'm, I'm grateful. So let's just dive in. So basically, the, the um, framing question of this research is, why do we still consider New Orleans a French place? It's, it's a rich question, and the answer is not as obvious as we would think. Um, so let's, let's look at um, kind of a French snapshot and see what North America looked like for almost, a, well, say about a century. And it's going to take an, we are going to take an east-west orientation and imagine that uh, French settlers came this way, which they did, through uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, down the St. Lawrence Seaway, through the Great Lakes to explore. All the way here, actually, if you're curious where I am right now, I'm about right here in Michigan, South Central Michigan, even though I'm from New Orleans. So I'm still freezing up here, even after 30 plus years. And uh, so the French then continued, uh, they were cold up here too, and uh, you know, continued to explore the Great Lakes, and then went down the Mississippi River. And um, so this started with uh, fishermen who just kind of came across um, the newfound land that they called in French, Terre Neuf, brand new land, like, oh my God, there's land, brand new land, let's call it Terre Neuf, brand new land, which uh, it's still called in French now. And, uh, and then we have Acadia here, which was um, an independent colony. The Acadians were the first people to actually change their identity en route to the New World. And they didn't want to be French anymore, but they certainly wanted to be Catholic. And uh, so uh, Acadie consisted of, um, of Nova Scotia, what we call now Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. Um, and so the French, uh, as far as their settling this land, like I said, it began in the, uh, in the Renaissance. Um, so that would have been, let's see, in 1534. Um, Port Royal, Port Royal, Nova Scotia here was settled um, quite some time later in 1605. Quebec City was just a few years after that in 1608. And then we jump all the way down to Haiti, which isn't even on the map, which was settled in 1627. And Haiti will be very important to our story in the future. Um, moving on, the Louisiana Territory was settled um, or claimed, if you will, by La Salle. Many of you know this. And um, what you might not have known is that he didn't make it all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So we actually claimed all of this land in this part of North America for King Louis XIV um, at a place that maybe some of you know, Venice, Louisiana. It wasn't until, um, let's see, 17 years later that Iberville by accident found the mouth of the Mississippi River when he was in a storm in the Gulf of Mexico and thought he was gonna die. And instead of hitting rock, he hit um, mudflats and uh, found that it was, uh, it was not salted water on the other side. So it was, uh, it was fresh water and he basically said, this must be the mouth of the Mississippi River. In getting us now to the 18th century, Detroit, Detroit was, was founded by Cadillac in uh, 1701. And then we have our dear New Orleans founded by Bienville in 1718. Okay, so New Orleans, let's think about this though. The French period ended in 1762. So New Orleans has not been French since 1762. That's as long as Detroit, St. Louis and other cities founded by the French. French is no longer a commonly spoken language in the city. There's little historical link to France. So what is the story? And the story for me is also personal because I am a New Orleans native and um, you know, French isn't a foreign language in my family. If I'm, if I'm here today as, as a PhD, it's because I just stuck with French because it was, it was part of uh, our growing up. And we're, my siblings and I are the first generation of Guenons not to have French as a first language. We were even French French because our because our ancestor again and our great grandfather Jean Baptiste was uh, straight from France um, only a couple generations back. 
So what is the story? Now it's not the story of all of French Louisiana. It's the story of why do we still consider New Orleans French after all this time? So this is my conjurings, if you will. Okay, first of all, the French were half-hearted colonists. This isn't me conjuring it, this is the historical fact. Louis XIV was more interested in Europe than in the New World colonies. You know, France at the time was, uh, was the, the, the big kid in Europe, uh, the big player in Europe. And so it was really wanting to not lose this sense of glory and exceptionalism that got them into the colonial, um, into the, into the colonial processing to begin with. And um, there was a lot of peer pressure basically from the British, their perennial enemies. France made use, like other countries did, of companies to do the work of settling their territories. Settlers had a lot of freedom and autonomy about how and where they lived and with whom they made families. And one thing about, about this is that um, the French never really, really appreciated the land of North America, in part because unlike the Spanish, gold and silver were not found. Unlike the British, um, there, were, there was not a big demand to settle in new lands. And so the population of Louisiana, La Louisiana, the Louisiana territory was only a quarter of what was found in the British colonies. So I, uh, I'm assuming you can see all of my slides, but I know I've got some other stuff on the screen too. So hopefully you can see through that. But the founders of Louisiana were Canadians, the Lemoyne family, Bienville, was the champion of New Orleans as the capital of the Louisiana Territory. Um, he relied and others relied on the local nations for guidance and survival, especially in the New Orleans area, the Kinapisas, but also the Choctaws who were um, the perennial uh, allies of the French against the Choctaws, I, I'm sorry, against the, um, the, I'm drawing a blank on the name, who were with the Chickasaw that were with, um, basically aligned with the British. Also, there was the Bayou Gula and the, the Homa and the Natchez Indians, all, all players in the French colonial machine. Also, the voyageurs and the coureurs de bois served as guides for the new French settlers. So if you're interested in what some other um, cities were that were vying to be the capital of Louisiana, the Louisiana Territory, it included Pensacola, Mobile, Dauphin Island, Biloxi, English Churn, Manchac, Bayou St. John at Lake Pontchartrain, and Natchez. So here's a text from a French settler, Gérard Pellerin. Some of his descendants are online, including myself. And he paints a picture of Louisiana from his arrival in, uh, let's see, the picture he's painting is in 1719. And I'm gonna read you some excerpts from this letter because it really gives us insight into the into the, the oppressions of the French and the process of settling and how that really did span that incredible expanse of land that you saw that represented La Nouvelle France and La Louisiane. So um, they arrived, the French made landfall at this time at Dauphin Island, showing that they knew so little, so little about what the land was that they were claiming as their own. So he writes, Pellerin writes, Dauphin Island is the first of all the islands. We spent about two weeks there. The only aspect of this island was that it was an infectious sinkhole populated by pit worms. It does not give a great impression of this country. But he, uh, he continued, he and his family and uh, his uh, indentured servants, and um, I believe he already did own slaves when he arrived. Um, they continue uh, inland. And uh, so he continues to explain. An explanation is due here to educate you on what it means to make camp, which uh, the word that he says is used is cabane, or to make stew. And the word he uh, says here is faire chaudière. Terms, he says, are, that are used by the voyageur in Louisiana. These are terms, he says, that, comes to, that come to us from the Canadians who use them during their voyages as well as others. We, i.e. the French, we would use other terms in their place to explain these things. A few days later, he writes, the next day we arrived at Lake Pontchartrain and the day after we went and made Cabanet early at the Bayou, 
This word means small river in Canadian, he says, in New Orleans. One can go up two good leagues and going one more league, one comes upon New Orleans where there are three houses for Canadians and a company store. And the three houses for Canadians show you the connection um, to Bienville and the Lemoyne family and the connections that existed in, um, in New Orleans from the very beginning with Canada because the Lemoyne family was Canadian. Their, their father, Iberville and Bienville's father had immigrated from France and settled in Canada and actually assimilated um, enough where um, he and other people in the family spoke several Indian languages. So moving on, um, in France, it was a different tale. It was a tale of civilization. And here's a map of seven, from 1720. So basically the same time as Pellerin is saying, in New Orleans, there are three houses and a company store. This map shows the story that was given to the, um, to the French. And it was not, none less, nothing less than an example of propaganda to try to lure people to this idyllic civilized world. And I invite you to remember this part of the map that we're gonna see referenced in a little bit. I know growing up in New Orleans, um, I, you know, I was um, familiar with the story of Fille La Cassette and it was really um, a story about, you know, uh, protected young girls who managed to arrive in New Orleans to be um, desirable, marriageable spouses for the men here. Um, the historical record doesn't support that to 100, to, to, to a, a hundred percent, at 100% to a full degree. It gives a more conflicted um, experience. And before I say this, before I go into this, I just wanna say that what is missing are the, um, uh, stories from the perspective of a survivor, a, a young woman basically put on a boat and sent to this wilderness. Um, how did she survive? Um, so with that said, the historical record does offer some of the, the, the following. Even before the founding of New Orleans and until 1728, marriageable women were sent to Louisiana. So just between 1712 and 1721, 1,200 women arrived. Bienville was not happy with much that resulted from these newly arrived settlers. Women who might not have been prostitutes in France became such due to the extreme conditions in Louisiana. I'm not saying that the record says everyone became a prostitute, just saying that a lot of women did. And by 1732, Perrier and Salmon claimed that all the dissolute women had been exiled from the colony. Here you have a painting oopsies, from a famous French painter of the time, Watteau, who describes the sense in France of having a, a daughter sent to Louisiana. Um, basically, this is entitled, uh, alors, uh, Le départ pour les îles, so going off to the islands, not just Louisiana, but any of the Caribbean islands. And you see the, um, the broken, potentially the broken hearted mother or matron. Um, you see people who are obviously suffering by her. You see this young girl who's a bit potentially clueless about her fate. And then, and then what we see here are some potentially unscrupulous and very eager men waiting to take her. So it is um, obviously a very fraught, a very, very fraught story. In any case, the, um, in spite of these individual experiences, the design of, oops, c'est pas possible. C'est pas possible, pardon. The design of the French Quarter um, really looks like a fort. Um, it, and it's, it follows the Bastille style of, um, of urban design that's typical of, of some um, of the French colonial cities of the time. And this represents, this particular orientation represents, I think very clearly this idea that the French had a, had a mission civilisatrice, that there's a civilizing mission that they took to their colonial um, machine and they really wanted to, um, to leave a French imprint on the new world in order to improve it. And that 
um, had, a, had that informed not just how they built cities, but how they interacted with First Nation peoples, um, how, they, how, how they were able to justify slavery and, and many other things. So if we move on then to this, uh, this French um, space that uh, New Orleans represented, and in case you haven't already put two and two together, when I talk about New Orleans of the time, La Nouvelle Orléans, I'm talking about the current today French Quarter. So um, this is a segment of the map you already saw with um, the Place Down, today's Jackson Square, St. Louis Church, which initially was actually pointing away from the river, and then La Grande Rue, Orleans Avenue, which was the main street in the early French city. This at the time would have conjured Versailles. It would have conjured Versailles for the, for the, uh, the colonists and for the people who were um, uh, directing the colony from France. So you have the Place d'Armes here. You have the uh, Chateau, which would have been the seat of government for, for Louis XIV or the regent later, Philippe Duc d'Orléans. And then you also had the Grand Canal and the gardens there. And so it, it is very deliberately trying to conjure Versailles the order that that represented. Even today, when you look at a, at a, at a, at a map online, you see that same layout, even though we have a river orientation today that was not there originally. What I found really interesting, okay, so, so I am from New Orleans and I grew up in this um, French, French family. I studied French uh, at the University of New Orleans, at UL Lafayette, got my PhD from LSU, and uh, moved up to Michigan, pretty much. What then happened is that being somebody who studied the 17th and 18th century as a scholar, I have, a, have on, on the one hand, a scholar's perspective about my hometown, but then I also have a, I have a native perspective. And so, so I, We'll often see things that are kind of half and half. I'll see, I'll, 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 I'll read something and say that's true, but, and that goes both ways. And so um, all this to say that when I started really thinking about the layout of New Orleans, La Nouvelle Orléans, the French period, I started seeing patterns that growing up in New Orleans, I had never seen. And basically it allowed me to come up with I like a kind of a, an explanation about why we have the streets we have in the French Quarter. What do those names mean? So, so um, just to uh, situate New Orleans at the time, it was settled, I think I might've mentioned this, three years after Louis XIV died. The regent was Philippe Duc d'Orléans. Um, the uh, crown prince who would become Louis XV was a mere child and was the great grandson of Louis XIV. So, the French were on pins and needles about what the future would be of the monarchy because it was, it was hanging by a thread and there had been many people who died over the course of the last couple of years. And so there was a lot of anxiety around that. So you have a new, here you have a new colony that is being, um, that is being uh, orchestrated by the French with, like we said, a lot of, um, a lot of autonomy on the part of the people who were actually in the colony because of the gap between France and the New World. There's not, it's not a robust interconnected network at all. It's, it's kind of hit and miss. And so Adrien de Poger, I think, it, I think in English it's, it's Poger, Hogger. I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced in New Orleans. This is a name I got familiar with after I became more researcher than someone living there. Um, but uh, he was an engineer brought basically to find, a, find the mouth of the Mississippi River and, and uh, he found himself having to, having to create the city, urban grid. And so if we look back here and look to kind of um, the, the part of the city that would represent government, that would represent Versailles, like the Chateau, the Palace of Versailles, we see that the um, that St. Louis Cathedral, originally St. Louis Church, named after um, uh, St. Louis, King of France, I think it was St. Louis, the, or King Louis the, the Ninth. Um, we have this right in the middle of the grid. And, oops, 
Um, and we have it um, looking out to Orleans Avenue. And so here you have an intersection between the monarchy and the Catholic Church. And remember that it was the divine right of kings that allowed for the monarchy to exist, to be justified. So, you, so basically, in, in Catholic Europe, you had the idea that there was God, then there was the Pope, and then there was the Pope who would crown kings or who allowed for there to be uh, the crowning of kings. And so government and power were very much aligned in, in France, especially at this time, between the Catholic Church and the uh, and, and the, the Bourbon dynasty. And so you have uh, Orleans Avenue, which I conjure refers to Philippe, Duc d'Orléans. And then um, you have the paired streets. And the, the name of the streets that I'm talking about, it's really not changed much at all since 1722. So it's been, what, 300 years? And with all the changes that have happened in the city, um, this hasn't changed. And I do think that that is a, a big reason why we still consider this a French place. It's a constant, constant reminder of, of the history. Okay, so the period, c'est pas possible. Oh. I'm sorry, there we go. I have to be careful how I press buttons. Okay, so the paired streets here are St. Peter and St. Anne on each side of Orleans Avenue. For those of you familiar with uh, Catholic doctrine, St. Peter is in a sense, the patriarch of, of humanity with the Catholic church. Jesus Christ, said to St. Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. And it's a little bit more obvious in, in French because the word for rock and the word for Peter is the same word, it's Pierre. Whereas um, flanking Orleans Street on, to, to, uh, on the other side is St. Anne, the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary, according to uh, Catholic doctrine. So in a sense, you have the matriarch and the patriarch of the, of the Catholic church that are supporting the regent in his work. However, the regent situation is not as stable as it might have been if he were a crowned, uh, if, if he were an, an outright king. So this is where I begin wondering and suggest that the paired streets of Toulouse and Dumain have a lot of meaning in this particular time frame because yes, they were real people, but they were two very important real people to the colony at this particular time with Toulouse um, and Dumain being, a, um, being two children of Louis XIV by an early mistress of his, uh, Madame de Montespan. And actually their sister was important enough to actually be the wife of uh, Philippe d'Orléans. And so these were major players um, and they, uh, they had actually been un, or legitimized, unbastardized, to use a really offensive term, um, for a spell. But then um, later on they got re-bastardized, that's why I'm using this term, by Philippe Duc d'Orléans at the suggestion of uh, John Law when he was running the, uh, the Company of the Indies and, uh, and wanting to solidify his power. He failed, the Mississippi bubble burst and uh, things didn't go well. The Company of the Indies moved to, um, to be managed by the French government after that. Nonetheless, at the time of the naming of these streets, Toulouse and, and Jumaine were potential rulers of France. And then we move off to um, one last pairing in this direction, St. Philip and St. Louis. Well, if we're thinking in these terms, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of thought to think St. Louis refers to Louis XIV, but more importantly, Louis XV, who was the crown prince, whereas uh, St. Philip would, would be the patron saint of Philippe Duc d'Orléans. So it's really quite, um, I see this as hedging the bets and trying to keep favor um, of the French government, however that might play out. If we look at the streets parallel to the, to the river, we see Royal, Bourbon, Dauphine, and Burgundy. If we start with Burgundy, um, that is the second in line to the French throne. 
Dauphine would refer to the Dauphin, who is first in line for the French throne. Bourbon is the dynasty of the time who are the ruling royals. And so I really believe that this was um, a strategic ploy on the part of, of those running the colony to, um, to garner as much favor as possible with whoever they could that might have a say on their well-being in the future. Um, the other names have moved around, uh, some have changed, so I won't, I won't talk about them except to, to give an homage to Bienville because uh, even though the locations changed a bit over the course of 300 years, his name has always been there. He had, there's always been a street named after the founder of the city. All right, so appealing to the French did not work. Um, in the early 1600s, half of La Louisiane was given over to the Spanish, just given. The French didn't want it anymore. And the other half, however, was lost to the British at the end of the French and Indian War. Many of you know the story about how um, the French general Montcalm was defeated by the British general Wolfe on the plains of Abraham in Quebec City. And that spelled the end basically of French North America. New Orleans experienced collective trauma from this event, and Francophone Creoles were emboldened by the seven-year period before the Spanish took possession of the colony. So basically, their outrage, even if you don't speak French, I think you can understand the, uh, the exclamation points, and this was the outrage that the historian Gaillaret says was expressed at the time, and it reads, Ce n'était pas assez que la colonie eût été divisée et qu'une partie eût été cédée à l'Angleterre. Il fallait encore que la portion qui était restée à la France prête à foi et hommage à un souverain étranger. Il n'y avait plus de Français dans l'ancienne Louisiane, il n'y avait que des Anglais et des Espagnols. So, it wasn't enough that the French lost. Um, the war, but it's that they gave over Louisiana to the Spanish. This led to the rebellion of 1768, the first attempt to create an independent republic in North America, predating, of course, the American Revolution. And the aim was to create the Republic of Louisiana. If we call it a rebellion, it's because it didn't work. Um, the Spanish did squelch it. Bloody O'Reilly arrived with troops. And um, and had the organizers killed on what is now Frenchman Street. So basically we're at the end of the official French period in New Orleans history over 250 years ago. This is it. The rest then begs the question, well, why for 250 years, when after only about a 50 year rule in the city, do we still consider this a French place? Okay, so this is, my, this is my take on it. We have to consider this other route. Instead of thinking about an east-west route from Europe being transplanted um, directly here in the, in the form of developing a colony, how about if we think about New Orleans as um, on the north coast of the Caribbean Sea? If we do, we can easily understand the importance then of north-south routes from the Yucatan, from Cuba, but most importantly, from Haiti for French purposes, Saint-Domingue. So for that huge swath of land that represented um, the, uh, uh, the French colonial enterprise in North America, all the fur and the fish and the semi-precious uh, minerals that were found could not in any way approach the value that Haiti had for the French because that was the source of their sugar. Haiti provided sugar for all of France. And so that uh, caused them to, to really take slavery to its absolute limit. We'll get to that in a little bit and talk about the Haitian Revolution. But first we have to talk about Creolization and we have to talk about the Spanish period. Okay, so um, let's talk about creolization. So creoles existed throughout the Caribbean and creolization is a word that 
requires some context. And so for me, when I use this word, this is what I'm talking about. The term creolization in the French colonial context refers to the rapid transformation of native land and people in the Americas due to the arrival of Europeans and Africans who were implicated in the in colony building of slaving societies in the Caribbean basin in the 16th and 17th century. So basically it is an amalgam. It's a gumbo. It's, you know, a melting pot, however you want to think about it. Um, there, there, there were, it was survival that, that mattered in the, for the founding years. It, there was no chance of hierarchical societies and, and divides. People just were bent on surviving. So given that, the Francophone Creoles in New Orleans during the French period and into the Spanish period, um, really up through the beginning of the American period, they, they identified as speaking French and practicing some form of Catholicism. They did not view race as a black and white divide, although whites generally enjoyed more privileges than people of color. And both whites and free people of color could be slaveholders and were. Um, so, so basically it was whites, free people of color and slaves that made, um, made up the tripartite society that we see in the colony. I um, rely a lot in my approach to the theory that's proposed by uh, the late Edouard Glissant, pictured here, who was actually on, um, on staff at Louisiana State when I was there in my doctoral program. And um, he, at the time, I didn't know how important his theory was at the time because I wasn't studying this. I was studying 17th century French stuff. But, um, but I've come to uh, really see the truth in the writings that he, that he put forth. And so for him, la créolité means this. So borrowing from his notion of créolité, I argue that New Orleans from its founding has been a Creole place, a blending of peoples, languages and customs, a place where colonists were able to reinvent themselves around a common French language and culture. And so if we think about reinvention, I want to bring up the founder of Detroit. I think I mentioned it was Cadillac. So Cadillac was born in France and he came over uh, as an adolescent uh, and kind of came of age in Canada and then uh, really was, a, was quite an effective advocate of his own interests in, in the, the colonial process of the French. He was also a scoundrel. And, um, and he kind of created this, um, this noble title for himself. He was not called Cadillac in France. And, uh, and so he was able to, um, you know, become a noble if you will, and just walk right in and, and, and be seen as a noble because everybody was able to exchange uh, uh, noble titles as, at will, basically. And so um, this reinvention this imagination, this ability to, to kind of claim the life that one dreams of is something that I think has been true from the founding of New Orleans up through today. So we're, we're, we're in the Spanish times, remember, so we have, you know, La Nueva Orleans. And so the city was under Spanish rule for about as long as it was under French rule. The Spanish gave New Orleans exceptional status and invested heavily in the city. And there are about 30 buildings that remain such as our dear Cabildo here, the Presbyter and uh, like 28 other buildings. And if you're interested in thinking about streets that are date, that date from this time period, we have St. Charles named after Carlos Tres, the King of Spain at the time. We have uh, Carondelet Street. We have um, his wife, the Baroness Carondelet. Um, being the inspiration for the name Barone Street, um, as well as Galvez and a, and a few others. But, but the Spanish, for any potential researchers out there, it's really the Spanish period that needs to really be researched because there's, there's hardly anything that really treats the Spanish period with, with the, it's just you. Further complicating this transition to Spanish, um, rule in Louisiana is that the waves of Acadians began to arrive in Louisiana, having been chased by the English from Acadie in seven, beginning in 1755 in what has come to be known as Le Grand Dérangement or the Great Upheaval. And so 
the the Acadians um, basically were were in, forced into a diaspora and wandered along the co the sea coast of um, the Atlantic shores, as well as back to France. Uh, some went to the Caribbean, others um, went uh, to other places to try to find find a, a home. And little by little, they arrived in Louisiana before the Spanish had actually taken over the governing of the colony. So even though they arrived during the Spanish period, it was still the French who were governing and who looked at them as, not as French people, but as Acadiens, who would, um, through their, through their industriousness, to be kind of stereotypical about it, but nonetheless, this is what the, this is what the writings say, with their industriousness and their, their sense of family, um, that they, that it boded well for the success of their, uh, of, of, of the places that they were going to settle. However, these French administrators, I'll just reiterate, did not see them as French, but as les Acadiens. Okay, so, we have intense creolization during the Spanish period for a lot of reasons, the resistance of the locals. We also have um, New Orleans that became the most African of all North American cities, demographically, economically, and politically. And some of that had to do with the growing number of free people of color um, who were allowed to be self manumitted individuals. They were able to buy their own freedom. And so this was easier under Spanish rule than it had been under French rule. It also served the Spanish well because they had less resistance, they thought, um, if they had more free people of color who would have been, um, who would have been able to gain their freedom during the Spanish rule, there would be less resistance from the Francophone Creoles because the numbers would shift. Remember that um, Spain didn't want this territory. Spain had never been given another, another colonizer's land before like this. And so Carlos III treated it differently. He wanted to be much more involved in the workings of it, I think from fear that it was just not gonna go well. And so there were there were all kinds of things that happened in, in New Orleans that maybe didn't happen in the other Spanish colonies in North America. So what we have is um, the end of the Spanish period that I'm getting to. And in this map to the left, this is what we see as the, um, this is what we see right around 1760 at the end of the Seven Years' War where, um, the big swatch that had been French North America has been melded on the one hand east of the Mississippi River into the British colonies. And here, I don't think you can read it, but this is reserved for the Indians. You know how that went. And then the land west here was uh, what was to become the Louisiana Purchase. So the Louisiana Purchase is really only about maybe two thirds of what the original um, New France and Louisiana territories uh, encompassing. Okay, so for the French, um, we have the selling of Louisiana. It was not a purchase, it was selling. And so um, the Louisiana Creoles called it La Vente de la Louisiane and it happened, the deed happened here, this is, um, where Napoleon signed the, um, the papers to give over uh, Louisiana to, or to sell the, the, the land of the Louisiana territory to the government of Thomas Jefferson. However, I just wanna make it clear and explicit that the French never took possession of that land after the Spanish. So we think it was given up by the French, but the French had given it up back in 1762 or so. And so here we have the room in Malmaison, which is uh, Josephine Bonaparte's uh, chateau. This is the place where uh, her then husband uh, signed the, uh, the Louisiana Purchase. And here's an example of some of the official documentation. Complicating things is Haiti. 
And that is that the Haitian Revolution had begun um, at the, uh, let's see, a few years earlier, and it continued as these revolutions go. It lasted, uh, it's lasted some decades, and people began leaving. And the people who left, um, eventually, many, many, many came to New Orleans, and they, uh, their arrival was the impetus to uh, develop what we now know as the Marigny, the Faubourg Marigny. And it was, um, and it was basically to house them. It's not a, uh, it's not by chance that it's on this side of New Orleans. That the the uh, this, this remains, this reinforces this notion of French side because for those of you who know New Orleans, the side here is uh, uptown, upriver, and it's the American side. So, so um, the the effect of having so many um, uh, of these people arrive in New Orleans uh, was huge. So let's, let's get at two reasons for that, for the importance of this event. Francophone New Orleans doubles in size just as it becomes an American territory. So it becomes more French and it becomes more like the New Orleans that we know today when the French period is long gone, the Spanish period is just ending and the Americans are are, are ruling. So the arrival of such a large number of French speaking immigrants from a home country that had experienced a successful slave revolution terrified the government of Thomas Jefferson and added to the anxiety that the US, US felt with the French language in Louisiana. It was not welcome. French the French was not welcome then and arguably it's still not welcome. Conversely, the arrival of Haitian immigrants reaffirmed the Frenchness of the city and reinforced the common identity between New Orleans and Dominican or Haitian Creoles that became stronger over the ensuing decades. Um, however, we have pretty much forgotten this um, as, as a process. So much of that period has been lost because you have this confluence of French speakers in an Anglo environment within the United States. And so as far as, as, far as um, people who have informed our collective understanding as kind of typical Americans of this time period, it would be Kate Chopin and uh, George Washington Cable, there's also Lascati O'Hearn, Grace King, and uh, that I'm dissing Grace King. I'm, I'm feeling a little bad about this because I am an alum of Grace King High School as well. But, um, you know, that to be Anglo means that you simply cannot understand the experience of Francophone Creoles in New Orleans. It's, and at least from the perspective of the Creoles, they were not happy. They were not happy at all. They weren't happy in part because these were the writers getting published, whereas all these writers were not getting published. In particular, um, uh, Adrian Ruquette really didn't like Cable. Um, you had people, these writers are, uh, you know, women, men, white, black, some of the names that you might be familiar with. Um, would be Latille, Rouquette, Garot, Delahousse, Canoge, Lanus, Mercier, Séjour, Testu, Seligny, Desson, Thierry, Tujac, Kesti. And if we have access to these, to these um, books today, it's really in, in uh, a large part because of the efforts of uh, Dana Cress at the Edition Tantamar in, uh, at Centenary College. Okay, so with the arrival of the Haitians, uh, New Orleans became, no, and the Americans, became the most important port in the United States with cotton, with the, with, um, the slaving trade where, you know, individuals were sold into bondage as well as, as just being, you know, the main, the main city on the, on the Mississippi River for both arrival and, and departures. Um, to and from North America. It was huge. Getting more into some things that I'm interested in, 
Uh, we had whites and free people of color who created newspapers, journals, poetry, literature, music, etc. So in other words, the birthplace of the earliest examples of literature and music by African Americans was happening in our city. And we don't talk about it that way. Also, politically, this Francophone Creole city produced proactive rights for people of color during Reconstruction. And Plessy v. Ferguson, which uh, many of you would know is the bedrock of, um, of uh, the, the landmark case on which Brown versus Board of Education is based that made for desegregation. And I, I'd be happy to talk more about Plessy uh, in the question session, but I'm assuming that you all are familiar enough with that. So we have New Orleans with all of this uh, dynamic growth culturally, whereas in the antebellum South, and this is where we're getting to Frenchness, okay? So uh, race was identified as a binary, black and white. There was no place for pre free people of color, basically. Elite Creoles, understandably, sought to integrate into American society. However, in this situation, at that time, the record shows that Creole suggested being of African descent. However, this is where I begin to, to conjure that identifying as French did not evoke blackness, but rather distinctiveness, and in many cases, refinement. So therefore, French or Latin, as you can sometimes find in writings of the time, it was preferred rather than Creole, which, which suggested African heritage. So French becomes so much more important at this time, once again. This is something else that happened throughout the, the 19th century. New Orleans became more Americanized. Its Anglophone population grew. Its people, its free, peop, free people of color, and then after the Civil War, people of color lost more and more of their privilege. So there was ironically loss after the Civil War on the part of a, of a cohort of people in New Orleans and in South Louisiana, which would be the free people of color. Its notions of race in New Orleans reflected the prevailing black white binary of the segregated South. And so the notion of white Creole took root in New Orleans, a blend of French and Spanish heritage. So in, in our family, we were raised white Creole. Um, imagine my surprise when I was in Cameroon, West Africa, and I ate the exact same recipe of my mama's griots um, in Kribi on the Atlantic coast. And then um, in, in a village being feted by a chief, uh, Bashingu chief in, in, uh, in, in, in Cameroon. His wives, three of his seven wives, uh, made basically the same recipe as my mama's kubuyong. My mom had no idea she was cooking African dishes when she was in our kitchen. So while New Orleans became Anglophone, let's take a step back and consider all of the state of Louisiana, Francophone Creoles and Cajuns of Southwest Louisiana or Acadiana were not as quickly assimilated into US culture. Whereas in New Orleans, French is no longer the lingua franca in Southwest Louisiana, there's still at least, and this is a conservative uh, estimate, at least 100,000 Cajun uh, French and Creole French speakers, as opposed to greater New Orleans. So this is where, again, being a local, knowing how things kind of be coalesced around French um, in, the mid, in the mid century, we begin to see how it folds back into New Orleans. And so, New Orleans becomes French again in the 21st century. And this is a real thing. Cultural references become lived realities. Migration and immigration patterns created transplanted Francophone communities. And globalization makes French localized. So this is with um, the, the, the diplomatic connections that are perennial in the city, the economic connections that are obvious and the educational uh, uh, opportunities of like French immersion schools and, and the like. It, it, um, all of these things reinforce each other, I argue. Um, we know that thanks to uh, De Majo and Codafil, um, that Louisiana became a bilingual state. It's been a bilingual state since 1968. Actually, I'm here because of the Codafil program. That was my off-campus study. 
and opened up this world of, uh, of uh, using my French in, the edu in an educational setting. Um, so I'm forever indebted to Codafil. Also in post-Katrina New Orleans, we have um, both historical and imagined connections to France engendered new ones as New Orleans remade itself after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. I mean, you had the fleur de lis on steroids and you have the colors of the Bourbon dynasty. You have, you know, the conjure for us also, Joan of Arc, um, that, that, that was a source of, uh, of energy and hope for us. Also, I don't know how many of you know that Louisiana was actually recognized as a member of La Francophonie uh, in 2018. And uh, this is a map to show you like where we now belong. Uh, and this is due, I, I see, as uh, uh, to the cultural fusion between the country, if you will, of Acadiana, as we would call it, and the city of New Orleans it became integrated into the network of La Francophonie. And so in conclusion, French New Orleans, a Creole city throughout history, that, that it can be explained as follows. Frenchness was reaffirmed when becoming a Spanish territory. You know, the, the Cajuns arrived during that time. When New Orleans became an American territory with the Haitians arriving that time. And after natural disasters, remaining a, co a, a collective reference from the past to inform the, the present. That New Orleans history of Frenchness has operated as a fluid reference with permeable boundaries built on re the relations described by Glissant, and that sustaining New Orleans as a French space represents ongoing creolization spanning the last three centuries. The dynamics, finally, of creolization is the fuel that keeps the city alive and propelling it to the future. So here's some, some of my uh, sources, and then, of course, I'm here for les questions. Perfect. Thank you, Diane. That was fantastic. All right, we've got a host of questions. So let's get started on those because I know a lot, we have a lot of questions here. So uh, let's see. Let's start with uh, Brad asks, he said he, lear I, he learned that Louisiana switched colonial rule, but that the population maintained French well into the 19th century. So doesn't that still effectively make it, effectively make it a French, in quotations, area as to distinguish it from Detroit and St. Louis? So um, I'm not quite sure how, how to answer that. It would, I think we, this is something we could talk about during my next trip to New Orleans. But um, what, what happened that didn't happen in Detroit, what happened in New Orleans that didn't happen in Detroit was just the, um, the density of the population. So absolutely, yes, I, I believe given the question, I would say yes, the difference is that there haven't been enough uh, French speakers concentrated enough in Detroit for it to remain. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense. Okay, let's see. Um, Regine asked if Gerard Pellerin owned enslaved people when coming here in 1719, do you, know, do you have any knowledge of how he came about being a slave owner? Did he buy enslaved people who came on the first ship with, Amer with Africans on board in 1719? So um, uh, no, that's that's easy. There wouldn't have been slaves sold on that ship. The, the Middle Passage was a was a different embarkation. Um, I would say probably. I, I shouldn't. I should never say no, but I'll say probably not. Um, a distant cousin is actually on this call, and she and I continue to research Gerard Pellerin because he is such a fascinating person. Um, he. Uh, he basically was with the Royal, the French Royal Navy, and he joined the Royal Navy in Havana, Cuba, when he was still a teenager. Hmm. Havana. Um, when he arrives in this letter that you saw, he talks about how the many trips that he has made, this is to colonies in, um, in like Pondicherry in India, as well as you know, the Caribbean elsewhere, the many trips he had made prepared him differently than the other colonists. And so uh, Jamie Minutis uh, Smith and I are working to try to understand more about his his uh, his life um, before coming to New Orleans and after arriving. And um, I have been on his tail, um, spending months in the archives in Aix-en-Provence as well as in Paris, 
um, in New Orleans, and I hope to go uh, even to some other archives in the north. Jamie's been busy um, tracing his, uh, his life and, and the life of our family, basically, um, uh, in Louisiana. So it's really complicated, and I want to know that as well, because I don't understand how he got to where he was, given that he, um, he uh, there's just so many questions that we have about him and a lack of information. Um, uh, we have a Pellerin who, Chad Pellerin, who, who, who put in a little uh, uh, information um, about some research her family did on Gerard and her understanding was that he came earlier than that as an explorer and his journal uh, has, been has been translated. Um, and there were two brothers who were with the exploration. Gerald, Gerald was one, don't know how, how indentured or enslaved were brought here, but not from the islands nor during his earlier visit, uh, voyages. So uh, just mm -hmm. some information there. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm interested in the first letter. I've, I've tried to find it. I've not been able to find it. All right. And he doesn't talk about, he doesn't, he, when he arrived in 1719, he doesn't talk about a, a brother at all, except he's writing to his relative. Oh, okay. Um, okay, another question from Regine. Would you ar argue that Creoles are an American ethnic group in and itself, maybe the only ethnic group from the new world? Um, perhaps if we define it largely, which runs uh, in the face of Spanish definitions and British definitions, but Spanish in particular, because Creole in Spanish means being basically white European 100% as far as heritage goes. Great, all right, let's see. Um, uh, Yvette Rubio says, in the intro to the book, Remaking New Orleans, the editors say that New Orleans is devoted to recreating over and over again the illusion that it is frozen in time. This concept of New Orleans doesn't actually preserve authenticity and exceptionalism uniqueness. It instead commoditizes those tropes we have come to see as New Orleans in its food, music, and Mardi Gras. In short, New Orleans has a much longer history of place branding. What stands out according to these writers is that the locals have brought into these tropes, including the notion of Creole. Do you agree with this? Yeah, I do. I also think it's always been there. I think it's, you know, this was settled by a company, if you will. I mean, it's always been a commodity. There's always been, there's always been selling, you know, there's always been propaganda. And so does it make me happy? No. But do I see it as something new? No, I don't. <laughs> I've never thought of it that way. That makes a lot of sense right there. Um, <laughs> Michael Mason asks, which regent gifted uh, Bernard de Marigny the original large portion of land that eventually be split up and sold to create so many of the Faubourgs of New Orleans? And I guess his land, uh, there might have been some land on the North Shore as well. So um, basically the Company of the Indies would have granted that and that would have been, um, let's see, I, I don't know if, if it would have been during, let's see, I, I really don't know enough to be able to give to, to, to um, uh, say for sure when it would have been granted, but the, uh, it's the Company of the Indies that would give those land grants and, uh, and manage the, the colony. And so the company um, uh, developed over time as well. And so uh, we know that there was a large, he was a, he had a huge swath of, of land and that um, he sold it, you know, in order to house the Haitians and that, um, you know, St. Bernard Avenue was named after him. So it's still, you know, he still has his imprint there in many different ways. All right, good. If anybody else has any last second questions, not that this is a topic that has, you can get in a couple of words, but we have, uh, we have uh, enough time for one or two more questions if you have them. And I'll give a second. Um, and I, I, ooh, I did want to mention, I have put the link to the book, which is discounted already. And you can purchase it at the 1850 house uh, for members. And I believe Louisiana residents, we ship it for free anyway. So um, one more question. So we, we had mul multiple fantastic presentations. Thank you so much. But do you make a distinction between descendants of Acadians and Cajuns? And do you consider these people, uh, the, them as Creoles? So um, Acadians became Cajuns. It's the same, it's the same families. It's just that it's an um, anglicized pronunciation of Acadian becoming Cajun. Um, would I consider them Creoles? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 
from my definition because of the blending. At the same time, I recognize that these families have, um, have stayed to some degree, at least according to the record, intact from leaving West France, um, you know, in the 16th century, basically, uh, and, and, and taking, uh, taking up settlements in uh, Acadie and then, and then down to Louisiana. So they're more than other, than other groups, the, the Cajuns really do have kind of an identifiable um, grouping. However, they don't live in an island, obviously. And so of course, they're, they, they are part of the bigger Creole dynamics that we all kind of uh, are familiar with. Uh, Pam mentioned here, and this is the last thing I'll say, uh, as, as, as myself, I'm born, to, I mean, married to a new Iberian, she says that when she moved to, new, uh, to Louisiana in 1974, that, and she moved to New Iberia, Louisiana, that they did not, uh, they weren't allowed to speak French there, which my wife says to me that that was, that, that was the way that, you know, they were brought up in the, in the 80s and stuff, and that French wasn't accepted then. So uh, things have changed. So it's, it's yes, very well, we have many uh, French speakers over there now. So with that, I want to thank you so much, uh, Diane, so much for this lecture. It was fantastic. And I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in tonight. And uh, we will see hopefully everybody on May 25th, it's a Tuesday, um, at 6 p.m. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. And uh, you'll get a recording tomorrow morning. A couple people have asked. Yeah, around 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, you'll be getting the link so that you can watch it again if you missed a piece of it or you want to you miss some notes or you missed, came halfway in, you're going to be able to see it. So don't worry. So thank you all for showing up tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bonsoir.